And now, live from the studios of Freedom's Phoenix, Ernest Hancock. Believe me when I say we have a difficult time ahead of us. But if we are to be prepared for it, we must first shed our fear of it. I stand here without fear because I remember. I remember that I am here not because of the path that lies before me, but because of the path that lies behind me. I remember that for 100 years we have fought these machines. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here! Fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, fear here on uh, the, 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 the glare. Your independence with me, Ernest Hancock, here in Phoenix, Arizona, from the BEAU Tiefel Studios of Freedoms of the Nest, Phoenix, Phoenix, the Dark. Boom. Tim Pichot, come on in and say hello. Good, We're talking morning. Little... Good morning, everybody. We're going to say uh, you know, a little bit about Trump this and economy that and so on. And um, yeah, Dr. Frank's going to, he has he has to play baby. You know, mom went home, so he's got he's got to, like do baby stuff. Well, I've got I've got two babies at home under the age of three with no in laws. So yeah, but, but you have uh, a wife that's not a doctor. You know, going to do doctor every day. <laughs> yep, and uh, yeah, got me there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, she's a Savarta busy girl too. So having mom around was awesome, but uh, now he's got to play baby. Well, yeah, he'll 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 pop in every now and then, call in, and we'll we'll do some trumping every now and then. But you know, uh, Tim Pachote had plenty to talk about. He went, oh, oh, oh God, say something about something. And then in the second hour, we have Dave uh, Scotese, and he is with litmoracracy dot com analysis of the professor. Uh, if robots get consciousness. They likely would enslave human humans, probably. Yeah, I think that's a natural tendency. I, you know, in every movie. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna talk to Dave uh, Scotese about that. I didn't even know he was coming. That's awesome. John Whitehead from the Rutherford Institute, you know, Rutherford.org is coming in the third hour. Gonna talk about an update on the American police state. Now, are we in a police state? Uh. I don't know. It depends what definition you use. But man, damn, it's looking pretty bad. So, Tim Joe, what do you want to go on about today, man? There's a lot of news going on. Uh, we're not at war yet with somebody. I just can't muster up enough, give a crap to read too deep into the stories because it's just all propaganda. You know, I don't, I don't even know what what's going on. So I ask uh, Tim Pacho, what's up? Well, I think the greatest war is with uh, not the necessarily the freedom of press, but the freedom oppress. I mean, we're look right now what's going on is I think it's one of the most important times probably in my entire life because what we see happening is for the first time, you know, the public is now now starting to not trust the intelligence agencies and they're starting to actually start just barely just getting there. Just, I mean, obviously this this crowd and this audience, you know, everything I'm saying is not really news to them. But the average, you know, rank and file Republican, the average rank and file person that's out there, trust the intelligence agencies. They trust the CIA. They trust the FBI. You know, we need all this stuff to protect terrorism. And now they're starting to find out that oh wait, there was like you know a secret stay behind network at the FBI that was put there to basically thwart Trump and. Oh, wait, you've got an actual secret society, you know, in their quotes at the FBI, you know, again, to, you know, toward the efforts of Trump. And you've got, you know, and, and when Trump was first coming on board, you had, uh, what is it, Schumer, who said, we've got seven ways of Sunday to get back at the president. And yeah, I remember, um, was that after his election that Schumer said that or was it? I, I think it was while Obama was a lame duck. So I think it was in the in the transition yeah, there was. Um, well, I mean, it was uh, after the election of. Yes. Of, yeah, I think because I remember that Schumer's going, "Hey, there's a bunch of ways that we're going to," and I'm going, "Wow, it must you must have really small inside." You know what I mean? Your manhood be you know not hanging low. I'm I'm like there is something to be able to 
you know, have to be compelled to say that. You know, I was going, damn. You know, I mean, whether it's true or not, you know, just to say it. I Either think we, way. I think, I think we know it's true, but yeah. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, for Schumer to have to feel the end say, yeah, we're going to get you anyway. And this is how petty these people are. So I'm, all right, all right, all right. So this is what was going on, you know, as the news. And, of course, we have it up uh, on Freedom's Phoenix, and I kind of scan it a little bit. I just can't muster up enough, give a crap to, you know, get all involved in it. But the um, bottom line is, is that, there were texts between FBI agents that they want access to, and they're gone, okay? They had deleted, but there was some Congress or something that got them to have them. So anyway, they're out there. And there was other texts where they were saying we need to delete the text. And I heard somebody say, well, maybe Trump should give his, uh, should give his statement to Mueller in text, and that way the FBI will end up losing him. Uh, so. All right, so the concept is, is that there's these texts between FBI agents that have them colluding with how they're going to attack and get uh, Trump, and um, and it documents it all. And then they went on about some little secret handshake society they have. Yeah, where they would meet off-site, and it was, you know, you know, and again, it's not every single person in the FBI, not every person's bad in the FBI, and that's how we know about some of this stuff. But you got the people at the top, you know, the they, them, those, you know, maybe the top 30 who, you know, all their stuff was messed up. They were there waiting to get the Teneo IPO. They were there waiting to get, you know, the keys to the kingdom. They were there to, you know, basically put the final noose around this uh, republic's neck to, you know, for once and for all, you know, basically squatch all all their opposition. And basically Trump, you know, set their agenda back, you know, potentially decades. And again, there's a lot of things that I don't like that Trump is doing and I'm not here just to, you know, completely you know, grovel to everything that's going on. But when you take a look at the other side and you take a look at the censorship, the third, that the other side at the left is trying to claim that, you know, that, you know, Trump is like Stalin. Actually, that's, that's, uh, that's Jeff Flake over here in Arizona, who's on the right, supposedly, uh, saying that Trump reminds him of Stalin. But then you look at the censorship that's going on. Just the other day, Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein wrote a, wrote, uh, a letter to Mark Zuckerberg and uh, the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, calling for them to stop the hashtag, uh, I believe it was re- released a memo from going viral. So, I mean, you want to talk about a Stalinist, you know, move. Uh, I mean, you go to, someone go on Twitter right now and go to the Drudge Report. Every single one of Drudge's tweets says, you know, this is hidden because it's it could be insensitive material. I mean, so you want to talk about censorship. The censorship is coming the other direction. You want to talk about censorship. Look at my Facebook page where in two months it looked like I was, you know, the price of Bitcoin going up to the moon. And then all of a sudden I got completely shadow banned where they won't even share my stuff anymore. They won't share my stuff to new people anymore. And, you, and, it, and it's all like, I can prove it. I can show you what it looks like. You know, it's not a coincidence. This stuff is happening. So the censorship is happening to, you know, anybody, you know, to the, you know, to the right of basically Stalin over here. Mm. And it's just, and, and luckily now the average American public is starting to realize this. Is starting to realize that the media is fake news. They're starting to realize, wait, the intelligence agencies, you know, are there to basically blackmail the politicians and to control, you know, perpetuate the deep state. It's not there for you and me. And I got into it with a lot of Republicans, you know, not even too long ago about a lot of these uh, issues, but now those same people are starting to come around and say, wait, you know, the FBI would do this and the CIA would do this? You know, I can't believe it. And then obviously you and I are shaking our heads of like, yeah, duh, like, of, of course, you know, this is the stuff that's going on. And, but I see, a, you know, this is, you know, a watershed moment where the intelligence agencies and the media jumped a shark, so to speak, because now the, you know, the, it's just so blatant and in your face that, I mean, you'd have to be just completely programmed by the media to basically you know ignore what's going on at this point and you know i think one big mistake the democrats made is is trump i think was trying to be conciliatory when he came in wasn't trying to go after hillary clinton wasn't trying you know was you know trying to be somewhat of a nice guy and then the democrats they don't care they immediately then try to get him on everything whereas everything they're trying to get him on if you take a look at what the democrats are doing it's like a thousand times even worse i mean you want to talk about russian collusion let's talk about the democrats russian collusion i mean you want to talk about you know stalinist takeover let's talk about the democrats stalinist takeover i mean i mean it's like trump i think is saying like you want to play let's go tit for tat because he can keep he can keep going Tim has something to say. So we're going to let him keep saying it until he runs out of air. So when we, I got a bunch of questions. Though, I'll take a breath. Some other stuff going on in the economy. But uh, we'll be back. Tim Pichone. And, you know, like a little Trump report. In just a little bit. Oh, 
from the third letter of Captain Mark. The Crown's observation conditions us to be dishonest with ourselves. Therefore, constant surveillance produces a society of constant deception. Honest communication is the seed of civilized conduct. To deny us this seed is to deny us its fruits. But the Crown's primary objective is to stifle free thought itself, to make its subjects incapable of dissent. Seasoned pirates have always encrypted messages and codes and ciphers, so intercepted transmissions were incomprehensible. But today the Crown possesses advanced tools of pattern recognition that document, profile, and predict our every move. Today, piracy requires hailing frequencies completely invisible to the Crown. We are tired of poltergeists in the static. Looking for a community of like-minded scoundrels, or just want some swag to let the Crown know what you think of it? Join the conversation at PiratesWithoutBorders.com. Roads. It's the Ernest Hancock Show. Where we're going, there aren't any roads. Miss Shedlock is uh, an economist that we came across back in, God, it had to be like 05 or something. And I remember I was producing for Charles Goyette, and he said, you know, I, I give me something on the, there was some news about the big three. The automotive industry was having problems. And uh, he's going, yeah, give me, give me somebody you can talk about. So I did some research going around. The guy was really, uh, wrote some really good articles about it and skipped to the end. I mean, a lot of times you, you, you all right. When you're doing uh, internet research, uh, you'll have a lot of the main stream, the lame stream media, you know, the CNBCs and the USA Todays and the Washington Post and all fake this kind news. of stuff. Fake news, exactly. You know, of all the fake news guys, they're going, oh, no, 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 you didn't get the memo. Uh, this is what we're supposed to say about that. And I've seen this in, you know, in politics and, uh, you know, even the blog and move on and the left and the anti-war said they were. You know, they, they, they would, you know, this is the narrative that we are, all are approved to talk about. And I'm going, well, that internet isn't any good over there either. You know, these sources. Every now and then you have someone that uh, rises to the top because they're paid, you know, by the people. You know, they pay for their newsletter. You know, it's like Casey Research with Doug Casey. You have uh, Miss Shedlock, and it was, um, God, what they call it, the Whiskey the Whiskey Report or Whiskey uh, something. I can't remember he was publishing for this group. And now he's with another group. They have a group of newsletters. Matter of fact, Charles Goyette was hired by one of these uh, newsletter groups, and he would write for them. And so when I would do the research and you find somebody, you go, yeah, this guy, this is, you know, and I guess you're kind of, you have your own bias or something, but I just want to get through the BS. Well, uh, Miss Shedlock popped up as, man, let me tell you what's really going on with the American automotive industry. And I read this, and I'm going, damn. So I go to Charles, I said, you need to get this guy on. And uh, he goes, well, what's his bona fides? Well, he's a smart guy, and he's got, you know, this blog that does, yeah, uh, what, a blog? The hell's that, you know? Is it? So it, 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 it was a bias against, anyway, oh, it's just somebody on them, their, their internet, you know? And I'm going, no, no, this is where I find most of my information. And it was right about that time that we started creating Freedom's Phoenix. And it was from, you know, instances like this. I'm going, they're not giving credence to people that really know what's going on. There was a woman, her name, she went by Twist. She had her 17-year-old son set up a, a webpage for her. And then she wrote with a real estate attorney and her, and it was called housingdoom.com. And she was predicting, you know, what was coming. She's like, damn. She may not have got into the weeds and the the financials of it, but she knew they were BSing because she would travel around these developments and you would see where they put the styrofoam, you know, chicken wire, they're getting ready to stucco it. Well, they'd leave it at that stage and start the weather and turn yellow and you get weeds in the yards. And then you'd have all these people that did buy out of hundreds of homes, you'd have 30 and then they had all the HOA, you know, to cover. So they're paying, you know, $2,000 a month to clean their park or something, you know. And she's like, yeah, there's something weird going on. This was happening in Denver, here, Las Vegas. Well, the Wall Street Journal came out, and they wanted to go on tour and so on. And they, yeah, well, you know, they're saying, and some, and there's a little bit of anecdotal evidence of. And, and kind of, 
And it doesn't bet. They would get one story and then it'd be gone. You know, they wouldn't cover it. So one of these authors of what was really going on, what was coming that, you know, gave me kind of uh, uh, foresight into what was going to happen was Miss Shedlock. So I always check him, and he's got a story out right now. Existing home sales dropped 3.6% per- percent as supply hits 19-year low. That is not good, okay? What that means is, is you have fewer homes for sale out. The, usually when you have a low inventory, the price goes up. You have a 19-year low in supply, and housing prices are still dropping by almost 4%. I'm going, yep, here we go. These were the headlines when I looked back. If you go back right in the break, I'll go back. You know, it'd be 2007, 8. You go in there during the revolution years. You know, you know the politicking was, you know, distracting a lot of people. You go back there and you look, and it's the headlines were the same. Stock market's as high as it's ever going to be. Oh, real estate's ever, you know, always going up. Oh, everything's great. Consumer confidence, all-time high. Oh, all-time. Exu- irrational exuberance. I mean, you know, it's, it was just, and you're going, well, now what are people saying? it, Ernie, did you read the news? The stock markets, I had dinner with an old partner of mine, and he goes, uh, uh, he goes, yeah, but the stock market is at the all-time high, Ernie. It's, I'm going, when the hell is it not at the all-time high before it crashes? When is it not that? I mean, what, 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 you know, how old are you, man? You know, I mean, you see this stuff all the time. The Econo Day consensus estimate for December existing home sales was 5.75 million units at a seasonally adjusted annualized rate. Instead, home sales fell 3.6% to 5.5 million units in a range of 5.5 million units to 5 million. I mean, you can get all the data here. Bottom line is this. Existing sales... Value uh, costs are going down, and supply is at uh, um, a low for almost 20 years. I don't know. What are your comments, Tam? What do you think is going to happen? I mean, another thing I'd like to add is that's, that's on the backdrop where the rates, uh, relatively speaking, are still super low. And what we've, what we've been seeing is uh, if you look at what's supposed, and I'll give a little air quotes here, what supposedly is like the safest investment would be, let's say, like the seven to 10 year treasury. Mm-hmm. The people that invested into that over the last year are actually down money right now. So if you wanted to be super safe, you would actually be down right now. And one thing that nobody... Yeah, but down only a little bit. Down, you can go broke safely. <laughs> that's, a, that's a phrase I've been using for a while. But uh, last year when I gave a talk at the Breakfast Club right before Morpheus, uh, right before they ended up getting him, I, I had a presentation called The Trump Effect and Why Good News is Bad News. And so right now... And I see all this playing out exactly as as I was talking about, because you have all this supposed good news. Again, I'll do this in air quotes. So you've got, you know, the stock market all time highs. Yeah, all this all this great news. You know, it's a new day for America. I mean, even Alex Jones has turned the corner and said, you know, talking about how great everything is and Trump solved everything. So, I mean, you want to talk about contrarian indicator when Alex Jones is, you know, sounding like, you know, CNBC. You know, at that point, I think, you know, we've reached, you know, the, the peak the peak hysteria, but as all this good news, and again, I'll do some air quotes, is going on, it means that now the Federal Reserve doesn't have cover to not raise rates. And so the good news is going to lead to the rates going up, which is going to be bad news because this is an economy that's predicated on $20 trillion of debt that doesn't include Social Security, it doesn't include Medicare, which is more of an obligation than Social Security. It doesn't include all these wars. It doesn't include so many different things that it's not even funny. And so our government, our economy cannot handle higher interest rates at all. And, and people want to focus on Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin could go down to zero. And guess what? It wouldn't really matter in the grand scheme of things because the amount of whales that have Bitcoin that would have any like a trickle-down effect to the rest of the economy is probably slim to none. Whereas, guess what? If the rates only go up like 1% or 2%, that could be game over. Our economy cannot handle another 1% or 2% rise in interest rates because what would happen is as rates go up 1%, the underlying value of the bonds go down. So if rates go up 1%, the Fed would lose about $440 billion. And where, where are the regulators talking about that? Where is that being discussed on CNBC? Yeah, it's where's not. it being discussed that the so Fed let's, let's keep owns the debt? Dollars. Where'd that happen? Yeah. When did that happen? When did that happen? 1913 and, and on. No, 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 no. They've been buying that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we'll talk about it when we come back. 
Now, how much money will all those closeted Republican convention goers bring into the city, Marie? A lot. The average area prostitute normally makes around two to three hundred dollars a week jerking off truck drivers behind the bus station. I see. Next week, they are expecting to make 30 times that amount sucking off secretly gay Republicans. Wow. You figure the fact that these delegates are so repressed and filled with self-hatred. Yes. They tend to like the filthiest, kinkiest sex acts imaginable. Oh, that's right. Which tends to cost more. The average well-adjusted gay man has no desire to smear fecal matter all over his partner's <laughs> face would no. be beat up by him. But that is exactly the sort of thing that these repressed conservatives are willing to pay top dollar for. Okay, as well as the services of transsexuals, I oh, understand. Yes. A, a lot of the Republicans repeatedly call the prostitutes faggots or True. start crying after they've had sex with them. I suppose the prostitutes are shoring up on their politics so they can talk to the Republicans. Ha ha, Andrea, what do you think this is? Pretty woman? They're just there to get f***ed. Right. Thank you, Marie Byron. Oh, RNC's always a good time. This is the Onion News Network. It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. To be a part of the show, call 602-264-2800. Memos! Memos to financial guys. They say, hey, uh, you financial guys, you're not allowed to mine Bitcoin. You're not allowed because you're not allowed. Yeah, but I know it's going to go to credit. Yeah, that's why you're not allowed. You know, you, you got you to stay safe and go into the seven to ten years that lost money last year. You, and, you know, how dare you talk about Bitcoin? That is amazing that they would do that. Where does this happen? I mean, this is like totalitarian kind of stuff. So I, yeah, I'm not feeling warm. I'm going to ban calculators next. I mean, all, I mean, if you're mining Bitcoin, and I don't even mind Bitcoin for full disclosure, but however, um, you know, you I'm want not, to now, don't you? Yeah, it's like you know, <laughs> I want to. The um yeah I tell you I I need to talk to Tim Fry over at Roberts and Roberts and see you know I've been you know we got a little bit more silver here throw a little over there I mean it was like oh just buy more crypto or get more miners I don't know man another thousand dollars in silver just a you know hundred dollars more in silver to five hundred dollars more in silver just make me feel better you know because you just know and that's it. because even the cryptos are not. You know, I mean, you're right. I mean, you can't, like, hold it. You know, I'm still, you know, it, it was still, the crypto to me was still just my silver moving machine. You know, I can liquidate it here, you know, do a brain wallet, remember whatever phrase, go to, you know, south of whatever border, and boom, I can get it right back and go get more silver. Well, Davos are telling you you can't do that anymore, that we're going to regulate it out of existence. Regulate and, what out? Uh Bitcoin, I mean, supposedly. And then today, Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, basically said that they're going to start coming down hard on all the wallet providers, making sure that they have all KYC, AML. That's today on uh, CNBC. There's actually a Facebook page called, uh, I don't know if some of you have seen it out there, called CNBC Crypto, where it is, I mean, it's, it's the, I mean, you're talking about like the Judas Goat Crypto page. I mean, this is, you know, every day they're basically, it's nothing but, you know, I'd say, you know, the fear, uncertainty, doubt of basically why you shouldn't be in crypto, but it's called the CNBC Crypto page it's just at, i just monitored to see kind of the pulse of you know all the propaganda that's going on uh but yeah i mean if you want to get back to some of the economy stuff what i really see going on here is a big thing that everybody's you know completely missing as they're whistling past the graveyard is you know bitcoin could go to zero in the grand scheme of things it doesn't really matter the whole cryptocurrency space go to zero not really going to affect anything because it's still just a drop in the bucket compared to everything else the big enchilada is not even the stock market the big enchilada well, I would actually say the big enchilada is probably the dollar, but all, but along with that is the is the is the bonds, and so because the bond market is far bigger than the stock market, and what you're seeing is the bond market just now really is starting to break because as the as rates go up, the underlying values of the bonds go down. Okay, now, now stop right there, and we're going to need to have that explained. This this is who we're talking to, Tim Pachot, Libertarian Advisor. He's a wealth advisor with a CFP, whatever that means. Entrepreneur, Ironman triathlete, recognized hero and libertarian who wants to make Merck a better place for his daughters. Okay, so here's the financial planner guy. This is what he does. But every time he comes out and he talks and he says stuff like this, well, let me tell you what's going on. There's just some compliance officer going, "Hey, you're 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 financial advisor. You're not supposed to advise financially, you know, publicly or something." I mean, I don't understand this. It's like they got a. Are you guys supposed to understand what's going on? 
and then you're not supposed to express it to anybody. You, you can't write it down. You got that web page. You did this, you know, marketing thing. You shared on your blog. You're dead, you know, bad boy. You had slapped a ruler across the back of the hand, and you're not. So I'm going. What the hell good are you? So I, 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 so I need to, you know, have you explain that one thing. And I had explained to me, and I probably get it, but you know, for the audience, because uh, yeah, I know you. You just don't know. Yeah, that's it. But I, you know, um, when the interest rates go up on a bond, the underlying principal, the asset that you you bought that bond with, the value goes down. Okay. Why? So this concept is referred to as interest rate risk or duration risk. But let's say, you know, interest rates are, let's say, 3%, and you can get a 3% bond, and then now rates go up to 5%. Are you going to pay as much for that 3% bond if you can go out right now and buy one for 5 of, of course not, because, you know, there's a certain trade-off. Now, if you were to hold on, let's say you have a 10-year bond, and you hold on to that bond for the full 10 years as long as that company or municipality or country doesn't go bankrupt, you'll get your money back. So you put in a thousand dollars, you know, you get a, let's say a 3% rate, you know, you'll get your interest every year. And at the end of 10 years, you get your money back. However, let's say after two years, you want to sell that bond because you need to, you know, you need you have some expense that comes up or you need to liquidate. Well, what could happen is you could have to sell that for underneath the value you bought it at. And, and the math behind this of how they figure it out. And I'm going to you know, use easy numbers here. So let's say we had a million dollars, and you have a 10-year bond, or technically if the duration was 10 years, if the rates were to go up 1%, the underlying value would go down the inverse of what the duration is. So in layman's terms, if, you have a, if the duration is 10, for every 1% the rate goes up, the underlying value would go down by 10. If, you had, if the duration was 8, then it would, you know, if it goes up 1, it would go down 8. So that's to, basically in, in a... You know, uh, easiest way to explain it, is that how it happens. So if you have, so if you dollars, have the, uh, uh, I, I put it like this: um, whoever the hell is buying bonds, I have no idea why, because well, inflation is way more than whatever you're getting in. You know, I, I don't know why. It's because it makes it more liquid or they safe. Can, yeah. Well, for the past thirty years, the opposite of that has been going on. So when because when rates go down, the underlying value of the bonds go up. So if you had let's let's say you were getting paid seven percent. And now the prevailing bond. Everybody's going to want to buy that seven percent bond now. Yeah. So it's so so the opposite. So my entire lifetime, the it has been going in the opposite direction. Except now we've gotten ourselves into this position where the Fed is stuck between a rock and a hard place that's of their own doing, where they can't ever raise the rates. Yeah, of course they can raise the rates if they want to tank everything. But this entire economy is predicated on printing more and more money, getting deeper and deeper into debt, because the money is debt. It, I mean, the only way to get a dollar into the system is to create a dollar of debt. So from day one, this entire system is basically high-tech slavery that you can never get out from underneath because we have to pay interest to the Federal Reserve Reserved, then it's and then the whole thing is a scam and I see people that are just absolutely not taking this into account and all the regulators want to focus on you know Bitcoin and all these other all these other things that are going on and yes there are you know cryptos that are a scam in my but opinion. they're a yeah. teeny tiny drop in the bucket yeah you know when you're talking God what is it you know uh, how many hundreds of billions are there in crypto H half a trillion okay so five hundred billion dollars five hundred billion dollars chicken shit money Okay, so when you're talking the bond market, you're talking what? How many gazillions? I mean, I mean, you're talking tens of trillions. So, so the the crypto, but they see it as a. Um, uh, it's going to be amazing when you see crypto as a flight to safety and stability. Seriously, when cr crypto is flight to stability, you know you got issues. Okay, so this is what's happened. If you go and you buy a bunch of uh, bonds, and for whatever reason, you know, because it's more liquid or stable, or biggest reason is because they can take a big dump of cash. You, your company, you just sold, uh, you merged, you did, you got, oh, so I'm sitting here on a bunch of cash. What am I going to do with it? Put it on the mattress? I mean, I, I got to do something with it. Well, um, I don't know. They're not feeling real comfortable about banks, I guess, you know, but they go and they buy a bunch of treasuries. Well, I look at the 30 year treasury. You know, because that it's at like um, two point nine percent or something, and I remember when it was sixteen. Okay, it was just unsustainable. Kind of, you know, they had to increase it when Volcker back in Reagan day. Long story, but and we could never get back to that again ever because it would be. Can't. We can't even get to eight. We can't even get to. We can't even get to four. 
And because they, we have been checking. Well, right why now. did they do that? Because nobody will buy them. You know, why, why would they have such high interest rates on treasuries? So somebody would buy them. And to stop, and to stop runaway inflation. You know, and well, that's what Volcker was kind of, yeah, we got to, you got to stop this. And how that impacted, I have no idea. But uh, so I'm going, all right, so you buy all these bonds, you have them sitting there, and then the interest rate starts to go up. Well, the ones that you bought, you know, at 3%, well, nobody wants those when they go buy for the same amount of money and get 5%. Okay, so uh, why are they doing this? It's just to have mass liquidity, big giant numbers, and and they'll take a loss just to have some stability. Well, what happens when that stability goes away and the dollar value goes down? From the first letter of Captain Mark, history is full of flowery documents claiming to limit the power of the crown, but these poetic social contracts have been impotent to prevent the predation. Limited government is a lie they use to keep us submissive. The crown cannot be trusted to abide by its founding charters, nor its treaties, nor even its own rules. The essence of the crown is centralized violence, and I've had enough. That's why I raised my black banner. I am no revolutionary. My aim is not to reset the cycle of violence, but to break it. My aim is an evolved society, invisible to the crown. Not a new hierarchy, but decentralized networks with no central figure for the crown to target. If you want your servile life, keep it. But we will not submit to the crown's agenda. And when you are ready to stop being its beast of burden, ready for adventure and opportunity, join us at PiratesWithoutBorders.com. North, an extremely vocal opponent of gay marriage, drew fire during his 2010 re-election campaign for saying that the legalization of gay marriage would lead to man-horse marriages. In one instance, he told the New Haven Register, quote, It's a slippery slope. If we allow two men to marry, what's next? Men marrying horses? But yesterday, North found himself at the center of a media firestorm when the New York Times published photos of North on what appears to be romantic outings with a horse. Gathered during the Times' two-month investigation, the pictures show North in almost a dozen locations with the same three-year-old mare. A former aide discovered links to numerous horse-related sites, including phillyfreaks.com and hothindquarters.com on North's work computer. The Times is accusing North of using federal funds to pay for luxurious trips, including a three-night stay at the high-end Sueño Stables in Catalonia, Spain, last month. North released a statement yesterday claiming he only spent time with the horse twice while conducting research for his anti-gay marriage project. This is the Onion News Network. Freedom is the answer. What's the question? I want to break free. You're listening to Ernest Hancock. I want to break free. I want to break free from your lies. You're so self-satisfied. I don't need. Yeah, we just got to break free. All right. This is um, uh, an enormous amount of money are in the in bonds. Or break, or break three for the 10-year treasury. Break. Three. We've got to break three. Oh, right, yeah, going up. Sing. Yeah, you know. Well, the thing. This is what I check. If you look at the thirty-year Treasury, and you can see that back in the early '80s, it went to fifteen, sixteen percent. It was ridiculous, and uh, and it was there for longer than comfortable with. But man, are people wanting to borrow money from Merca then? You know, because you're paying sixteen percent for thirty years. Crap. I want a bunch of that, you know. But even then, the inflation was probably really twenty. So I mean, you're, you're right. still losing money. But, exactly. Uh, so it, uh, it it doesn't really it doesn't really work. I mean, you got to have something else that's a performing asset that you know gets. Well, I don't know. It's hard to beat sixteen percent. But um, then there was in the early nineties. It was like nineteen ninety, and that's when I first started getting in politics, going to Washington, all that kind of crap. And they were freaking out that they had to pay 8%. And this is when uh, Greece was going on, and they were going, oh, my God, they broke 6%. We're all going to die. And I'm going, hell, I remember when they were freaking out in America at 8 You know, so I'm going, why are they freaking out? Well, now they don't freak out so much. It's just like with the economy took a dump in 08. They're going, yeah, we, we, we got that covered. Well, they do a reserve requirement now. The bank, they have this big giant hunk of money that they're paying them not to lend out with all the lefts going, hey, 
They gave you all this bailout, and you're supposed to trickle down to us when we get, like, loans and stuff. And they go, uh, not so much. Because they were paying them to hold it there. Why? As a buffer. Because when this goes again, like 08 again, they don't want to blaze. All of a sudden, they don't have any money. The whole thing's going down. We need bailout, like, right freaking not later. No, they're going to have a bail in. And there's actually an article <laughs> on the Federal Reserve's own website that I found several years ago uh, where, the at the time, Stanley Fisher, who was the vice chairman of the Fed, actually said that we're going to have bail inable we need to issue these bail inable bonds aka you know everybody's going to be taking a haircut and i know we don't have too much time before your next guest comes on and i did want to talk a little bit about uh there was a zero hedge article uh, a few weeks ago uh where it, it was jerome powell who's the soon to be inducted new fed chairman and he starts talking about the Fer- the federal reserve's uh bond positioning and, and how they're going to be selling off their bonds right now and i'll kind of skip to his third concern because it ties into what you're saying here and it goes my third concern and others have touched on it as well is the problem of exiting from a near four trillion dollar balance sheet we've got a set of principles from june 2011 and i've done some work since then but it just seems to me that we seem to be way too confident that exit can be managed smoothly bingo markets can appear to be much more dynamic than we appear to think when you turn and say to the market, I've got 1.2 trillion of these things, it's not just the 20 billion a month, it's the sight of the whole thing coming. And I think there's a pretty good chance that you could have quite a dynamic response in the market. So right now, if you're holding on to U.S. Treasury... Quite debt, a dynamic response. I love how they word this crap. Yeah, so if you are the... <laughs> if you are, and, and I've got to give this guy a little bit of credit that he's actually saying some things that are surprised me for a Federal... Not that I'm here, ever going to give a Federal Reserve chairperson any credit, but he is... Try saying like, "Hey, man, I'm just coming in and inheriting this this ship," even though he was there uh, the entire time, uh, you know, for the last uh, couple of administrations. But why this is so, why this is so amazing to me right now is, I mean, you've got the Federal Reserve Chair admitting that basically, you know, hey, everybody thinks that we can just go ahead and you know get rid of this stuff easily. No, but it's that's not, not the, that's not the story. Well, to me, of- the story is that they even bought it to begin with. That it's on their balance sheet that you have the people that issue the money and they bought it at hundred cents in the dollar too. Yeah, buying the their bullshit. own, their you know, buying the U.S. debt with money they just printed it. That's just that's just stupid. And it was mortgage debt too from the banks. I mean, they bought all the toxic mortgage assets that nobody wanted, and they did so at a hundred cents on the dollar. To write off, yeah. they're written off. This is not performing. They're not going to pay it off. This is not. They just they just took and said, "Oh, we'll take this crap. Okay, we'll put." this uh, garbage bag over here in the corner and we'll put a dollar sign on it and they'll just sit there as a asset. You know, it's, you don't have to pay people to haul off the garbage. You know, so th- it means nothing. And this is all coming to unwind. And I'm, I, I'm, I, it was just a style. It was just, it was shuffling paper. It was nothing. And sooner or later, this all has to flush out. And that's what he's saying. We got this, all this stuff sitting here. What are we going to do with it? And well, the thing is, if you're China right now and you're holding on to you know a trillion dollars of our debt right now, and you know that Get rid of it, and you know that the Fed's going to be doing this, you want to front run them. You you don't want to say, hey, I don't want to be, be the one holding the bag here. And so, so what China did is about a week or two ago, they came out and said they said, you know, we're thinking about not buying any more debt. So in in Wall Street terms, is when you're saying it's a hold, that means. It's You're a sell. Selling, yeah. And so, you know, that's quite an amazing thing that's, that's going on. And, and also, while the rates are going up, it is supposed to be good, you know, supposedly for the dollar. And what we've seen is the dollar has gone down, you know, more at the beginning of this year than it has, you know, basically since I was 11 months old. So, I mean, it's been over 30 years since the last time the dollar started off a year this week. And last year, the dollar was down roughly, I'm not looking at any notes here, but it was down roughly 10%. And, and so we're continuing this. And, and a lot of people are saying that, you know, when the rates go up, or, you know, Wall Street guys say, you know, when the rates go up, well, then that means that there should be more demand for U.S. dollars, you know. And so you have the dollar going down with the same backdrop of, you know, basically negative interest rates all around the world, extremely low interest rates all around the world, and people still don't want to hold on to the dollar. And so it's the same situation you're talking about with home prices going down with the backdrop of being at, you know, whatever it was, 19-year lows, as I think you mentioned. So it's, the, supply, same, yeah. so it's the same deal. And, and, and then that's, this is going to have trickle down everywhere. And, and another thing that was in that article that was uh, particularly amazing to me is that you've, you've got, uh, what's his name, Jerome Powell talking about unloading their short volatility position. So I don't know if he means that the Fed was actually buying VIX. Uh, which is the volatility index that just measures how much basically the stock market goes up and down. And so why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a derivative. The VIX is just, it's just your side bet on what the weather is going to be. 
What the hell is the Fed doing in that? I mean, if you ask me what are the two worst investments you could have long term, I would probably say short the VIX and long term treasury bonds. Now, look at what the Federal Reserve has. Supposedly, they're short the VIX and they have long term treasury bonds. I mean, it's like they're the worst run hedge fund in the world, except they have such clout with $4.4 trillion that their clout then distorts everything else. So, a lot of the Things that you know, guys like myself and Peter Schiff have been talking about and yourself have been talking about for a while that are going to happen. A lot of the reason why it's been delayed is because they're in there with their trillions of dollars effing everything up and, and distorting things yeah. because we don't have a free market right now. A free market doesn't have a Federal Reserve system. A free market doesn't have uh, you know, a smart, uh, you know, these guys that go into a room and set interest rates because I'm smart enough to know that I'm not smart enough to be able to, to set in interest rates. It should be the market that sets it. You not know, this, I want to give you the, uh, the circumstances. Having gone through this you know, a few times you know, in my life, and certainly we analyzed a crap out of it in uh, 08, 9, 10, around in there, 7, 8, 9, 10. We were just, you know, getting into all the gas. We, you know, detailed everything. We had whiteboards and chalk on the weekends and people coming in and kind of got it, okay? Then they did. The, Racist with your whiteboards. They did, they, <laughs> they did this with, yeah, they did this with the, um, uh, the big short. Now, Davi just saw it for the first time a few nights ago with my in-laws. You know, we were over here watching. I'm going, and it's coming again. You know, they are doing the same thing. Well, if you're down in the bowels of the Titanic. We're, crowd, we're crowdfunding the sequel <laughs> buying crypto. <laughs> yeah. If you're down in the bowels of the Titanic and you see the whole side ripped and it's coming in. Well, there's some guys down there and they'll set up there just like they're on the field of a football game doing their commentary, whatever, for the finances. There'll be some guys saying, yep, it's coming in over here, and we got a rate of, and it's kind of in the, at this rate, kind of, no, we kind of got so and so over here, kind of stopped it up a little bit and slowed the bleed, kind of, kind of did that. and they'll sit there and analyze and go over and over, while uh, those of oh, us wait, that wait, knows what's happening, we're going to the top of the ship and lashing some doors together and whatever and getting the F out. Because I don't need to see the details and have all the stuff described in the crap when you know what's going to happen. You see my point? I don't need to go. How are they going to? How are they? How are they? How are they? And, they, and this guy and the news and the buzz and kind of and the old oh, crypto and kind of you know, all the shiny object distraction and stuff. You know what's going to happen. Get the boats. Kind of say you're giving them way too much credit because they're not over there analyzing what's going on. They're up there uh, arguing about the bar tag tab or talking about the weather as there's a as there's a huge hole in the ship. They don't even they don't even yeah, talk about any of this. Water's stuff. coming up to you're, their You're giving knees. them way too much credit right now. Because they are, because there is very few people talking about this message right now. Yeah, no, I, I see your point. I, I'm just trying to illustrate that, you know, uh, all this new. It doesn't matter. It's already done. It's baked in the cake. It's happened already. And it's Trump's going to be the, the bell's fall guy. already rung. And, and nothing Trump can do can stop this. Nothing. And that's why I'm so frustrated with all the Republicans who are now, you know, bought into all this. Uh, yeah, I mean, Trump. Is so what do you do? Thing. In five seconds. No, I mean... Buy something else. Get I can't, I can't the make... Crack, I can't call the right crack-up boom, where everybody will take these worthless dollars. Oh, I can get that rate for $40? Okay. You know, because that's how bad it's going to get. Time. More Declare Your Independence is coming up next, live, after the news, here on the Liberty Radio Network, LRN.FM.